Okay, let's start. Let's begin. All right, so, hey everybody, my name is Matthias. Uh, you probably heard that name a few times yesterday. And uh, I'm going to talk today about NG Animate and some of the new things in 1.3 and this new idea of sequencing animations. So it's wonderful to be here in Paris. And I live in Toronto, Canada. I've been working on Angular for about two years. And for the past year and a half, I've been working as a core developer. And you know, that's a picture of me. I purposely didn't shave so people can recognize me from this picture. But uh, Year of Moo is my website. And I blog about Angular, all the new things I'm doing, and anything that uh, I'm working on, namely with animations, that will likely show up on there first. And my Twitter handle is at Year of Moo. My website is www.yearofmoo.com. Please follow. And for the past two years working on Angular and working with the development team, it's been a real joy. The framework is amazing, and I really enjoy working with the developers on it. And the community is wonderful. And it's really great to have a conference like this, to have everybody in the same room sharing ideas. OK, so I'm here to talk about ng-animate. And it's unfair to assume that everybody's on the same page with it. I'm not going to spend 30 minutes talking about the basics of ng-animate. Just give me a couple minutes to give you an idea of what it is. So in Angular, we have directives. And directives change things around on a template. You have repeaters, you have if statements, like ng-if and you know, switch statements, all that stuff. And that's all going to deconstruct and reconstruct the DOM. When the reconstruction happens, if you include the ng-animate module, you can tap into the animations. So the standard ng-directives all do this. So to get up and running, you use the ng-animate module, and your application is animating away. You add a CSS class to the element, and that will allow you to tap into the animations using CSS and JavaScript, and then the browser takes over. So here we have the basic JavaScript code to put in ng-animate into your application. We use AngularJS, and we use AngularAnimate.js, and we include it as a module dependency. And that way, we can have an element like this, where we have an on-off button, which isn't really doing much now. But if we make a CSS transition using the ng-animate CSS code, we can add an animation directly to it. So if I add in zoom, you can see that the element animates away. <laughs> <laughs> My thoughts exactly. <laughs> I, uh, procrastination is always good because when you don't want to work on your slides, you end up building a slide deck in Angular. And uh, then it works really well. So <laughs> I'll open source it in a few weeks once I have it fully working. But anyways, I added another class to this and it's called box and it's animating away. Really cool. What does the CSS code look like? Well, we can use transitions. We can use keyframe animations. We can also use JavaScript animations. But we have a starting CSS class, and we have an active CSS class. So here we have the ng-enter class and the ng-enter active. When the ng-if statement was putting the component into the page, it adds these classes to the element to detect if an animation will commence. Here we're basically putting it from the left side of the screen to the center and we're fading it out. We're starting from opacity zero and fading it in. For JavaScript code, we can do the same thing, but clearly we can't use CSS code for that, so we have to use the module.animation and register the selector that's going to take control of the animation. So in this case, we have the enter animation code, we have the element, and it's specifying the styles, and we're using jQuery.animate, but you can use whatever animation library you want, GreenSock or the Web Animations API. The important thing is that you call done when the animation is ready. Cool. So the directives that support animation right out of the box in 1.3 are all of these. The list was much smaller in 1.2, but there's been a few new additions, such as ng-message, and the forms now support animations as well. Anything that involves taking stuff out of the DOM, putting it into the DOM, or mutating the DOM is likely to have an animation event. We can also do class-based animations which we'll use simple add class, remove class, but we can decorate it with our own animation code. So I'm going to do one more example with ng-animate. We have a repeat here. And this lists out a series of books. 
And I have two buttons, one that puts the books into the page and one that takes them out. And the books are going to be repeated into the page with an index and uh, a bold book title. So here we have a series of books. I've read a few of these. When I click hide, they're going to animate away. And when I click show, they're going to animate in. I have a class on the element called repeat animation where I use the ng enter ng leave thing. That's cool. And ng animate will animate the items that don't match the list of repeated items based on what's in the scope. So what we can also do is we can add a stagger to a repeater where we can specify the delay in between which items are added into the page and which items are removed. So now when I click hide, you can see that there's a 200 millisecond delay. And when I start searching for other items, you can see that they show up in a nice sequenced way. But don't let this fool you. This isn't the sequence here. We'll see that soon. But this is just a step in the right direction because the, the end user wants to see things happen gradually. You want to see the website get built gradually. You don't want to see everything flash and animate at the same moment. So before we talk more about that, let's talk about what's new in 1.3. So there have been a ton of bug fixes for ng-animate. And if you, you know, haven't kept up with 1.3 or if you're still using 1.2 or 1.1, I recommend you to update, upgrade to 1.3 because all of these fixes have really made the driver really good. Transitions and keyframes work as expected, and ng show and hide works much better now, and the staggering animations allow for other third-party code to be added in. And then we have a couple new features such as promise-based animations and inline style hinting. Oh, and by the way, that's my girlfriend's cat. She was just as happy about 1.3 as I was. Okay, so. Transitions and keyframe animations. So before, what ng-animate would do is when a transition started, it would cut off all the other transitions to it and then start it. And while this sounded OK, it kind of broke a lot of existing code. So it doesn't do this anymore. You can have infinite animations really easily. And now it's gone. <laughs> you can have infinite animations really easily, and it knows to add or remove the classes at the right time. ng-show. Back with 1.2, you had to have this annoying display block important property in the styling. You don't have to do that anymore. It's smart enough to apply these styles and then remove the element from the page and add it back. Very cool. So a third-party stagger, which is a nice feature in ng-animate. And this was a complete side effect of fixing four bugs in one commit. We came up with this nice extra feature. What you can do is you specify the stagger code, but you can pass in other keyframes from other libraries. So if you look at this example, we have here a series of numbers, and we're using animate.css, and we can specify the delay. So it's a 50, and now if I set hinge, you can see all the elements dropping off the page. It's really cool because you have the staggering capability in Angular, and then you have all of this third-party code, and you can just mix them together only using basic CSS. So there's another feature. If you want to have multiple animations running in parallel, if you want to have the parent animation running and all the child animations, you can add this attribute called ng-animate-children. But at the end of the day, if you do this, you'll have a cluster of animations just animating at the same time. And we'll learn how to control that later on in the talk. Promises allow you to not have to use these callback systems that we had before. You won't have a pyramid of callbacks. You can use simple promises to run code when the animation is done. And the only edge case with this is that it's not a regular promise. It's not within the digest cycle. So if you are going to be updating properties on the scope, you need to call scope.apply. And finally, with the class-based animations, before with ng-animate, if you did add class, remove class, and you put them all together, it became complicated because you would have one animation cancel out the other, and then if you're adding a class multiple times, it might not work. So what ng-animate does now is it combines all of these together into one animation. OK, let's take a look at a new feature of ng-animate. Now with ng-animate, we can pass in additional styling into our application. So for example, if we have something where a user clicks, then that styling will get applied to the element, but then if ng-animate detects an animation, it will merge them together. Let's see an example of this. So I'm going to restart this page. OK. Let me open this page. So we have here North America and Europe. 
And 2014 has been a lot of travel for me. And you know, going back and forth between Europe. And uh, <clears throat> I wanted to make a simple example using this inline styling where I can click on something and it'll show me where it is. So if I click on here in France, here we are. What's happening here is the click coordinates are provided from the directive into the animation. And then the transition and the keyframe animation all work together to animate the page. So if we look at the example here, we're adding an element, we're adding a class to an element, and then we're specifying the styles. And here, for example, we have a wave transition, which is a wave animation, which is animating that circle up and down. And then we have a transition to animate it across the screen. But what doesn't work in this example is that I can't click anywhere else. And that's because I already added the class to the circle. It's already active. That's why it's jumping up and down. If I wanted to have it so that I can continuously click and continuously tell the element to animate through ng-animate, we can use a new service function called animate.animate. And in here, we, this is exclusively designed to animate an element from one position to another. But we can give it a special class. And that special class can have animations tapped into it. So if we look here in the example code, here I'm adding the active class to that bouncing circle. If I change this to say animate, and um, let's say we, we have a two, we don't have any. So we have from animations where it's animating from, and two where it's going to animate to. And that's all we're doing is we're animating it towards a left and top coordinate. So now, if I click here, you can see that the keyframe and the transition and the click coordinates are all working together. So if I say that I went from Toronto, where I live, I went to Milan, oh, oops, and now I'm in here in Paris, and then I'm going to go to Amsterdam, and hopefully London, and then home, and there's probably about 10 other places I've gone to as well, this system of having the directive figure out where to go, the logic of the application, and then having the animations work on top of it makes for a really nice communication between directives and animations. And if I completely remove the animation, so if I remove all the transitions and stuff like that, the element still goes to where I click it to, but the animation isn't applied on top of it. So this is inline styling. So back to this slide, if you have a JavaScript animation, it will get provided as an extra property into the JavaScript animation. OK. And finally, for the animate method, you still have to provide a transition or a JavaScript animation, which will spread the animation for the duration of the transition. OK, so what else is there? Like, we've seen some really cool stuff so far. You know, the animations fixes in 1.3 allow for some crazy things to happen. But, you know, we need to have new things, we need to have cooler things in ng animate. And the biggest problem that I've found when it comes to this stuff is how do I sequence animations? Let's say I have a page that has a series of injury repeats, or a page that has a series of images. How can I make it so that the images load first, then the repeater, then everything else? You know, with ng animate children, we can have them all animate at the same time, but it's really hard to control <coughs> when one animation happens and then another one happens. You know, you could do something where you have a CSS style that says this is going to animate first and this one. But how can you have a group of animations happen? And then how do you tell the parent animation that I'm done? You know, so something like this just doesn't work too well. Here we have a delay of one second for the enter and for the leave. For a typical ng view animation, it's all right. It works fine. But when you have tons of elements on the screen, you're going to have tons of CSS code. And then you have tons of JavaScript code like this. And you're going to have a huge amount of coupling between your HTML and your JavaScript and your CSS. What we need is a little, a new language that can describe when elements come into the page. So we need template access. We need to have access to the template before it's inserted and access to the template before it's removed. And we need to be able to control what happens and when. So this is an experimental module. Oh, sorry, before I do that. The other thing I wanted to point out was that if we have other elements that are not Angular elements, like elements that aren't a part of directives, aren't using ng-if or ng-switch, we want to be able to animate those as well. But we don't want to clutter our HTML code with having tons of attributes, tons of Angular-style code. 
What we want is we want something just to find the elements on the screen and animate them accordingly. So we have this experimental module, and the API is not final. It's just to see what could happen with these complex layouts. Or what we could do is we could do animations like this, where we can control what elements come into the screen and when. So no, that isn't hard-coded. That's not some canvas element drawing a bunch of squares. That is just 100 divs and then the sequencer determining which elements to animate into the screen. Let's take a look at an example. So here we have a button that's showing a message on, this, on, my, on a blog, right? And I'm in the process of redesigning my blog, so I thought I would have something cool on there to have more visitors. So if I wanted to show this message right here, and if I click on NGF Visible, it's going to show everything right away. How could I hop in there and say I want to show each line one by one with a delay in between? So if we use the ng-animate layout module, what we could do is we could tell each of the structural directives how to render themselves, you know, how to show what property at what time. And then after that's all done, then it would call a parent animation to tell it that the animation is done. Once again, the API is not final, but what we could do is we could pass in this code into the application and say that on the enter event, we we're going to apply this sequence of animations, then this one. And then, once we're ready, this one as well. We can stagger it so if we have you know, 100 paragraph tags, we could say that there's going to be a delay in between each one. And then what we could do is we could even have animations run in a group. So back to the code, what we have here is we have the ngif. It's visible when visible is true. We're going to enter in each of the items into the page. And then once it's done, you know, we'll have all the list items into the page. So right now, this is in line with the ngif statement. The idea is that we'll put all these into, into a HTML import, and then you can have it as a link tag on your application. And then you can just pass in the sequence into the element. So what happens now? If I click on show greeting, there's that 500 millisecond delay between each item getting inserted to the page. But there's no animations. So that zoom class that we had before, if I add it here to each element, and add it again here, we can see that the animation works. But the problem with it is that we have to add it to every element on the page that we're trying to animate. And that's cluttering the HTML code. So what else could we do? Well, we can remove this. Oh no, let's refresh. <laughs> okay. so. What we could do here is we could pass in apply classes, and this will apply a CSS class to each of these elements. So if I say apply classes zoom, and now we look at it, we can see that each of the elements that have been matched by the sequencer will get animated accordingly. Okay, so let's continue then. So the, both of these examples are kind of small, they're like isolated examples. What could we really do with this? And it all kind of, the whole, the process of this started with material design because if we look at the material design spec, here it's having animations like this where we click on an element and then it zooms up and that goes to another page. We have the same thing here. There we go. We have the same thing here. And if we look further down, we have animations like this where you want to click on something and you want it to determine what elements animate at what time. And then you don't want to have animations like this where everything animates at the same time. Finally, you might want to have animations where one element goes bigger and the other ones reappear right after, so you can apply state to certain elements. This is what we're trying to accomplish with ng-animate layout. So let's take a look at a real example of this. So let me see if this works. Well, um, OK, so I'm going to go to this code in my example. And I'm going to delete the ng animation code just for a moment. And just update the code. So my, uh, my web server I have running is really strict. It does a lot of caching for some reason. So I have to add all this extra stuff to each file so that it knows to download the new one. <laughs> OK, so we have a basic website that has some animation support. We're animating ng view. And we click on, we start searching for things, and the new old view animates away, and the new one comes in. You know, this was cool last year when ng-animate was introduced, but we need better control of things. 
So how can I make it so that you know, if I click on something, then the whole page animates away, and then when I click on something again, the existing page animates away too. So let's go into the home page. And here we have a leave animation. And the leave animation is going to look for the header first, it's going to apply the fade class to it, then it's going to look for the user record, and it's going to apply the fade class as well, and have a stagger delay. And then let's go into the profile page. Let's see that in action too. So now I still need to update this annoying code. <laughs> if you ever see query string statements like that in code, in a real website, you'll know that somebody was debugging and they forgot it in there. <laughs> or they're trying to break a CDN's cache, but I think it would be a real timestamp, not a bunch of random characters. OK, so we click on here. The page fades out, the header fades out, and then we have the new page fade in. So we've controlled how the new elements come into, this, come into view and when they don't. So if I go back, you can see, I still got to refresh this page. So I don't believe this one has a leave animation. Yeah, that's why. But this one has a leave sequencer, and this one has an enter sequencer. So we've already controlled how a page looks. You know, we're getting closer and closer to what Flash applications were back in the day where you can control the layout in a much more convenient way. But if we go back to this code, we have one particular example here which is really hard to do. And it's taking an element from one view and transferring it to another view. How could we do that? You know, it is possible, you know, by cloning the element, moving it around. But having to have that code in your application, having to have that code adapt to your layout is really difficult. So what we could do with this we could pass this ng-animate keep. And what this is going to do is it's going to look for the elements to persist across views, and then match the element in the second view. So now, let me edit the code again. The more characters I type, the better it is. OK, so watch what happens when I click on this now. It got put into the right spot in the page. <laughs> so that's just some of the ideas that are possible with the sequencer code. We can basically enter and leave elements at the right time. We can also have other events, such as add class, remove class. We can transfer data from the scope into the application. And who knows, maybe much more ideas. So. What can this lead to then? And the way that I see this is that it doesn't have to be for animations only. It could be to really sequence the life cycle of an application. So that, so that if you have, say, a page that's this big, anything below here shouldn't be visible until you scroll past that part. Things like this. So any ideas are welcome, and who knows what this could lead to. But this is all my information for now. And here are my contact details and my email. And please follow me on Twitter. And it's been wonderful being here. Thank you so much. OK, I have time for two questions. No. Yes. So say that one more time, sir. <laughs> with how do I deal with reflow relayout? Reflow. Yeah. So the reflow reflow has always been the tricky part. Oh, so so the, the question, please? yes. So the question was, in the context of staggered animations and controlling enter repeat and stuff like that, how do we deal with reflow? And it's always been a very tricky thing to do, but. The transition code, the first class is added right before the request animation frame. And in that code, you can specify that the element's hidden. And then the active class is put after the request animation frame. So as long as the classes have the right styles, you won't see the element being shown in the page. For reflow, to make it efficient, what we do is we collect all of the items that we can before a request animation frame occurs, and then we put them into one frame. Because before, if earlier versions of ng animate, you would have all these animations happen and reflows happen and mobile applications would struggle. So with 1.3, it's a lot more efficient. And 
the way that we did it with keyframes is you have the animation play state, and if you set that to pause, it's going to go to the very first frame of the animation, and that will hide the animation. So it's, there's a lot of hacks, but it works. <laughs> so, you're asking the question? <laughs> or asking the question, sorry. Okay, next question. Yes, back there. So the sequencer code, it's still highly experimental. It's one of those things that I haven't seen much with any other framework. I can't say when it will be, but I'm working on it hard. <laughs> and uh, me and um, some of the people from the material design team are putting our ideas into it. So, so long as material design is progressing, then this thing will progress as well. Okay, that's all the time I have for questions. Thank you.